Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is Hashtag No Limits and I am your host, Shelly Kino. Hashtag No Limits is about people whose society has placed limits upon but who have busted through those limits. I believe 100% as Ophelia says in Hamlet that we know who we are but not who we will be and I think there is a great example of the caterpillar turning into the butterfly that just exemplifies that thought. While it's no easy task going from a caterpillar dissolving into your cells, reforming into the butterfly, and then having to struggle to get out of the cocoon in order for its wings to be strong enough to fly, neither is busting through limits that society places upon you. And today, I'm really excited to bring to you Kara Riska. She is um, a special needs mom coach, and she is also a podcast host. And so it's always fun to have another host on and have that person be the interviewee for a change. So if you're watching, give us a hashtag live. If you watch this in the replay, welcome and give us a hashtag replay. Enough business. Welcome, Kara. How are you today? I am good. I am uh, I'm living my life as it is and accepting it as it is. And I mentioned to you uh, before getting on the show that I thought I was going to be working with a client this morning and my son's health needs had another idea. So I had to adjust and pivot, but I think that is that is the life that a lot of us live. So yeah. um, I am well and stable, That's which is good, good for me. Good. <laughs> so yeah, so we have Fran joining us from Southern Illinois. Thanks, Fran, for joining us. So if anyone else is joining us, do exactly what Fran just did. And, um, or if you have any comments or questions for Kara or myself during the show, please pop them into the chat and I will be able to show those to Kara and share them with her. So Kara, tell us about your background. What is it that A, brought you to my show and B, what's the your podcast about? Well, I'll give you just a quick snapshot of how I became what I call a special needs mom. And uh, so my son is now 13. And back when he was two, he was diagnosed with brain tumor. And so he underwent a major surgery, which fortunately saved his life. However, uh, had a lot of impact to his brain. So he has a number of disabilities, including uh, visual impairment. So he's completely blind in one eye. He has hemiplegia. So that that looks like one of the side, his left side of his body is very different than his right side. So he has a, a modified gait and limited, limited mobility. Uh, he has a condition called panhypopituitarism, which is a long way of saying he doesn't have a pituitary. And uh, oh. a lot of... Um, we basically, you know, uh, you and I have uh, 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 automatic hormones. His are on manual. And so we're constantly adjusting. And actually, that's why he's home from school today is because we have, uh, we're having a little hard time uh, keeping him in, this, in the balance area. So he, he requires a lot of uh, attention in terms of understanding what's going on in his body and what support he needs. And then I think the thing that we didn't realize in the beginning was uh, all the behavioral challenges that he would have as a result of, his, of, his, of the impact to his brain. So that is kind of a quick snapshot of, of who I parent. I'm also a mom of three other children. And actually, my oldest son had an IEP for speech and my youngest daughter currently has an IEP. So I know as your area of expertise, I think that's interesting to kind of look at the proportion uh, over here in the family. I actually had an IEP when I was young, uh, also for speech. Look how far I've come. And um, (laughs) uh, let's see. So that's a little bit about kind of how I became a special needs mom. And Let's fast forward to about five years after my son uh, was basically in recovery. I, I kind of look at it that as uh, our life is recovery. I don't know that there's going to be a place where we get to with Levi that uh, we say, oh, we recovered. <laughs> and so really um, about five years, though, after his first surgery, he, um, you know, he was kind of rocking and rolling. And I had previously worked in a career um, very unrelated to, to what I do now. I was a project manager for uh, a landscape uh, world. So oh, okay. I in residential design and, and getting to meet a lot of really neat people and build a lot of beautiful things, but um, very different than uh, what I do now. And so as a result, I drove a lot. I drove a lot for that job and I was a avid podcast listener. And so I was always listening to people that inspired me. And I always knew that there was something beyond what I was currently doing that I was, that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I actually had this moment uh, when he was like, so back when he was two, when he was still in the hospital, when I was, you know, completely in, in, 
in it, um, I had a moment where it was very clear to me that this would be the thing that would call me to the next thing. And I had no idea what that was, but it was clear to me that there was something around what my son, I mean, I don't know how you can go through something so big and not have it inform your life. And so for those next five years, I really kind of just stayed in inquiry of like, what's next? What's, what's next? And on one of my podcasts, I heard about life coaching and I thought, well, okay, that sounds interesting. I think I had heard of it before, but I discounted it because it honestly sounds kind of funny. <laughs> Back when you first hear about it, you're like, really coach for life? Like that seems right. like now it's a bigger industry, but back then it wasn't, wasn't as much. So, so I signed up for the uh, most robust and uh, involved pro program I could find. Cause I'm the kind of person that if I'm going to do something, I want to do it. Well, I don't do things like half-heartedly I do them I'm all in and so that's how I started as a coach and interestingly enough I had zero desire or idea at that time of actually working with special needs moms and uh, it was after several years of coaching um, that I really saw the way I was supporting clients and I was seeing actually the needs I had in my own life and I was like wow, like I have to bring this to my people. I have to bring this to moms like me because I had gotten to a place where I was doing pretty well in terms of kind of managing all that it takes to manage lives like, like moms like I do. Right. And, uh, and so it was just time. I was ready. I was a, at a place where I felt like I had the capacity to give. And so that's when I started um, turning towards uh, – coaching uh, special needs parents. And pretty soon after that is when I started the podcast. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, and in, I'll add also, though, that um, this last year and a half, Levi had recurrence. So we had oh. more tumors pop up. Um, and so we are currently still, um, we're doing very well in terms of he's handled a lot of treatments very well. And, and the new scans look really good. But um, it just, I think, I share that because... Um, for many of the the moms that have children that have IEPs, um, mostly with the medical components, um, there's not necessarily an end to the challenges that we come across. They continue coming. So I mention that because yeah. we have really had to pivot. I have had to pivot um, so much as I supported myself um, and pull back from my business a little bit and kind of re-engage. And then like today, really, it's always pivoting. So still working on actually <laughs> on getting more support so that it doesn't feel quite so, um, I guess it kind of just feels stressful sometimes. Yeah, I, I can't honestly imagine. Um, I only have one child, first of all. So to have four, it, you know, I just imagine you're, you're always going, always thinking, what's next? Where, where do we have to go for this thing or that child or, or for this event for this child or, you know, just, just all of that in general. And then you throw in a child who has some different needs and then you have all the doctor's appointments and in your case, hospital stays and all of that stuff is just incredibly stressful. And then you think he's doing well and all is kind of smoothed out in that realm at least. And then you get reoccurrence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just imagine that the, that the life you lead is just pretty much a constant up and down roller coaster, just based on what you just said. <laughs> it is. It very much is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm so impressed. I've never met or um, I've been doing my, my, show here now for, um, at the time of this airing, I'm also going to put this out as a podcast, actual audio version, which will be probably another year from when it's airing live now. So, um, at this point I've had a, you're my 128th episode. Wow. And so I've also had the privilege of meeting lots of different people and learning about different entrepreneurs and different activities and, and life skills programs and, um, opportunities for jobs and whatnot, but a special needs mom, life coach has not come across my table until meeting you. And so I'm really interested in learning more about that aspect because so many of my listeners and former guests are moms of children with special needs. So I'd really like to talk about that. But before we get to that, <laughs> I do just want to talk about, you know, some of the, the other things that, that you've gone through and, and kind of 
dig a little bit deeper into some of the stuff that you've already mentioned. Um, so you said it was your oldest son who was diagnosed. Actually, he's, yeah. So I'll, I'll just give a quick snippet on that. So my oldest son is 15. And then Levi is currently, Levi is my, my special needs child. Um, he's 13. And then I have okay. a 10-year-old son. So the first three are boys. And then my daughter is five. So that's kind of the, the setup we have. So um, <laughs> uh, my oldest son was four at the time of Levi's diagnosis. Okay. And I was pregnant with my number three. So <laughs> I like to add that because I'm just kind of like, I, I look back and I'm like, wow, how how <laughs> did I even survive that? Right. And I think we can look back a lot. I think it's important to look back at things like that and recognize, well, okay, I survived that and acknowledge that we always have more than we think we do. But anyhow, so that's the age um, of my children right now. Yeah. So that is kind of what I want to unpack a little bit more is how did you get through that time? How did you, you know, handle things? Um, and, and the reason I ask is for encouragement for others who might be going through a, a, not exactly what you went through, but something similar to where they just think, oh, my goodness, you know, how how is this going to be possible to get through? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and actually, what's interesting is as I've uh, you know processed my own journey, as I have um, supported other moms, I've recognized there's kind of a an evolution that a lot of us go through, and it starts out you know with diagnosis. So for some of us, for some of us, that is. Um, you know, at birth, a lot of moms find out right at birth that there might be something different with their child or maybe even post prenatal, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but some of us, we acquire, uh, our child's difficulties and, um, there's always a point though that it starts obviously. And this is kind of when, you know, we are in what I call the stunned and survival phase. So there's this evolution I've seen. And so I've actually just given names to the stages to kind of help understand where we're at. It's really important to understand where we're at. One, for acceptance, to like accept where we're at. And it's not a problem. It's just where we are. Okay. And also to recognize that we won't be there forever. So there's this first stage, stunned and survival. It's a lifestyle, just like Fran said. And it's very much a lifestyle. And, um, and this evolution I speak of, it's, um, I think it's important to mention it's, it's not lineal, linear. I always confuse those two words. Anyhow, <laughs> okay. it doesn't go in a straight line. And um, we're always looping back and forth, even as I've described, the, you know, today, it was like, I kind of, you know, hop back into a right. quick moment of survival. So this first stage is stunned in survival. This is when we're learning about diagnosis. This is when we're literally in a fight for our child's life. This is when we're really um, not doing anything above and beyond. This is not when we're thinking about what we want to do for, with our life. This is really where it's like a very survival state. And this can last days or this can last years. I would say actually my stunned in survival because there was so much that we needed to adjust to in terms of learning to live with this very new body that my son had. Um, it was probably years. Um, then we move on towards what I call stable yet self-sacrificing. So as we moved on from like, okay, this is what we have many moms and not all, not all, you know, obviously this is a generalization, right. but we go into this, uh, state where it's like, all right, we dig in. We're like, okay, whatever our kid needs, we're going to make it happen. Whatever research, whatever program, whatever IEP, whatever they need, we're going to advocate and we're going to be the mama bear within and we're going to show up for our, our child which is beautiful. And I think we get to be in touch with our own strength and power. And yet sometimes it comes with a consequence. It comes with a consequence of the self-sacrifice. We forget to take care of ourselves. We forget to actually acknowledge we have needs and wants. And so what happens is we learn, uh, excuse me, what happens is that we, um, we forget who we are. We start to only focus on this child. And so the role of caretaker becomes the only identity that moms have. And they start to really resent that. So this is when we also see some resentment um, come in. This is when we start to see moms start to kind of say like, I don't want to stay here. And this is kind of what moves them into that next stage. When they exhaust that, that stage and they evolve into what I call the rebellion. And the rebellion is kind of saying, no, 
I can't do this forever. So it's not necessarily like I, well, sometimes it can be, I don't want to do this forever, but it's really that self-questioning and doubt of like, I can't do this forever. And they haven't yet determined um, or learned how to do it differently. And so they've exhausted this cert- this one way of being, uh, as in basically giving uh, unbalanced to their child. Um, I'll mention also in that first stage, excuse me, the second stage is often there's a desperation to heal or fix or change that child mm-hmm. because moms think, and obviously this might go for dads too, but but I primarily work with moms, mm-hmm. um, that if they change their child's diagnosis or if they solve one of the problems, then they, the mother, will feel better. And so we attach our well-being to that of our child's. And so therefore, we end up feeling very powerless and very trapped. Because in some of the cases, like let's just use my child's blindness as, a, as an example. Um, if I thought that he had to be unblind <laughs> for my life to be better, then I would obviously be trapped. Because it'd be, it would be me trying to change a circumstance to make myself feel better. And we can't change a lot of these things. And so that's, that second stage is where we're pushing up against this resistance. And we haven't necessarily accepted some things that we might need to accept in order to um, kind of have this balance. And to show up for our kids in a way that actually accepts where they are um, and allows for them to also grow and flourish and do all these amazing things that they're going to go on to do and whoever they're going to be. So we get into the third stage, the rebellion. Uh, I like to also call this stage alone and afraid because we're not necessarily physically alone, although sometimes that's the case, but really we feel alone. We feel isolated. We feel like no one understands. We feel like um, it's just, uh, it's just us. We don't have the resources. And then the afraid is really looking at, um, I can't do this alone. I can't do this forever. I can't. There's a lot of I can'ts in that that stage. This is the stage where I start working with most moms because they have, again, it's the rebellion where they're saying, I can't do this anymore. I need help. And so when we get into this stage is when we actually really do some of the work that it takes to accept. It's when we really actually learn how to acknowledge our own feelings. It's when we rediscover who we are and um, re-identify. uh, with the word reinvent our identity. So we kind of reclaim some of what was lost. And then we move on to the next stage where I call calm the chaos. And this is not necessarily external chaos, although that can be present and usually is. There's a lot of overwhelm um, in the lifestyle that we live. Um, just yesterday, I was I was feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> I had, I had um, my kids home from school. It was still their spring break. I have a business and I was managing a lot of complex things for my son's medical needs. And so that certainly can feel overwhelming. And so it's really, this is the stage where we are learning how to manage our lives. This is the stage where we're learning how to manage our minds. And this is the stage where we're learning how to ground ourselves to be able to be the moms that can show up for our kids and to show up for ourselves. And then as we kind of, you know, continue to practice and grow in that area, we, we continue to move along and evolve. And the last stage is what I call power, peace, and possibility. And it sounds very lofty. But really, when we do the work that we have the opportunity to do as these moms is we really have access to peace. We no longer are trying to change what can't be changed. We no longer are kind of getting tossed about by these emotions that we don't know where they're coming from. We actually get to land. And this is also the stage where a lot of us say, okay, like, how can I um, be an expression of who I am to serve other people, to help other people. So for some of them, it looks like starting an, uh, advocacy, an advocacy group. Um, and for some people, it looks like just doing the best they can for their family. Um, it looks different for everybody, depending on their gifting. But I think when we can uh, reclaim our contribution um, to being able to be who we are, it feels really good. So that's that kind of final stage. And as I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily go smoothly from one step to another. We might kind of toggle back and forth. And, you know, we might, uh, you know, I describe um, in my, when I tell my full story is, you know, I was feeling pretty rock solid um, prior to my son's recurrence. And certainly the experience of multiple surgeries and radiation and all of that came with that, um, you know, I certainly move through all the stages again um, and back again. So, um, so that's 
that's how I got through in, in terms of um, by moving through those stages. And um, along the way, I learned how to do this essentially by collecting uh, different resources, resources as in how learning how to process emotions, learning how to manage my mind. And these are the things like you mentioned, like at the time, I had no models in terms of I didn't have any special needs moms to look up to and say, I want to do it like her. I had no idea that um, coaches out there existed. There are a couple out there. I'm seeing them pop up, which is great because proportionally, um, uh, how many uh, parents with kids with disabilities there are to how many coaches there are for them right now. Like we need more in my opinion. Right. Right. Um, and so along the way, I'm an avid reader. I'm an avid podcaster. And, and so therefore I just, I, I had to bring that all together. And so that's kind of how I did it. And I think I did it much more slowly than perhaps some people that, um, one go into it with maybe some more resources than I did. Like I came from, I'll say a very low gradient of being able to process my emotions. I did not have a facility with that. So I had to really start at ground one from a, from an, uh, you know, a lot of ways. Um, so, but that's the gift that I get to give other people, right? Is they don't necessarily have to uh, go find it on their own. Like I can kind of bring it all to them. So that's how I survived. That is, and I 100% agree with Fran, an interesting and and a beautiful, honestly, way of breaking down the stages. As I said, I only have one child and I um, am a, a former special education teacher. And so I personally didn't go through the steps that you're talking about, the stages that you're talking about. But sadly, I sometimes was the one who had to um, tell the parents at that first IEP meeting that, yeah, Mm. your child does have a learning disability or your child is eligible for special education for whatever reason. And I, I saw just like them... I don't even really know how to describe it, but it was just, I don't want to say that they collapsed, but there was a definite weight that was suddenly added to their shoulders. And, you know, as gentle as we tried to be, I don't know that there is a gentle way to whether it's a medical professional or an educator or, you know, whatever other fields might give that, that eligibility. I don't know that there's an easy way to do that. And what you don't know about me is that um, I've written a book and it's called Mm. Those Who Can't Teach True Stories of Special Needs Families to Promote Acceptance, Inclusion, and Empathy. Mm. And there's 10 chapters in the book. Nine of them are all from nine different families who went through what you're talking about. Um, They are all somebody who most of them were the moms. I had a few dads that Mm -hmm. would that let me interview them and are part of the book um, and a few of the individuals themselves with the disability. And they talk a lot about what you just said and how it's, it's a very different for each, each person, each family. Um, And some of them have siblings who also have special needs. And so as the different children were born and then a different one was diagnosed with whatever eligibility for special education, then it was a different process as well. And it's, that's, that's a lot of why I do this show, but it was a big reason of why I wrote the book was to, to have your stories as parents, as well as the person with the disability story be told, because I think Mm. that we will be so much better off if we understand and have more empathy for everybody, but this just happens to be my passion <laughs> yeah, is, is being, you know, with the people who have the disabilities. And so um, it, it was heartbreaking for me as an outsider. And I, to watch these friends, these family, these coworkers go through those stages that you're talking about. I can't even fathom what the emotion level is like if you are the actual person going through all of those stages. So thank you very much for sharing that. And um, I'm hoping that that will give a lot of the moms, dads too. I do have like you, I have some, you know, we know that there are dads out there too, but it does seem like moms carry that more than dads do. 
or maybe they just show it more. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's funny. There's a couple dads I know of, um, that are the primary caretakers or were, um, one of the, my friends, his child passed. And so he was the primary caretaker of his son. And, uh, what's interesting is, is those dads, um, they come over and they're like part of this, you know, because they yeah. have a lot of the similar experiences, I think, because I think it is the primary caretaker journey. I could say that actually, instead of being so yeah. exclusive, but, um, <laughs> uh, because I think it is, uh, you know, it's like, it's the person that's, you know, uh, doing the research, scheduling the doctors, navigating the IEP, you know, like all of those things, I think, kind of add up to the picture of what it's like to be a special needs parent. Yeah. And I, I really, one of my hopes, as I was about halfway through writing the book, I thought, you know, I really want teachers to read this book because as educators, and and thankfully now the book's been out a couple of years and I've had a couple of hundred different teachers that I'm aware of and there's more because more than that have been sold of my book, but that have told me like, that is so awesome. Like we never get the parents perspective and they have told me what a a life changing book it has been for them as far as their teaching, because they now see parents differently and have, and, and so that that's like the biggest compliment someone can give me after they've read my book is like, I've changed because that's, yeah, I can. that's what I want. And that's what I want for this podcast and this our live stream is for, for people to come across an episode and, and, you know, by the time they finish watching one or 10, <laughs> that they mm-hmm. go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that all of these things were possible or I didn't have an understanding before. And now I do. And, and so I am so appreciative of what you're doing for the moms and dads out there too. Thank you. Well, I love, you know, you've written a book that that includes stories of parents like me. And I think uh, one of the things I've learned along the way and that I, I really kind of emphasize when I work with people is the value of stories. Um, one, owning our, our own story, but in reading other people's and or hearing whatever form we're, we're getting to be acquainted with them. But when we hear stories, even if it's about like something, maybe like, you know, perhaps someone has a child that has completely different disabilities than my son. Um, When a a shared story um, shares the emotional experience of what somebody's going with, going through, we connect with that. And so when we connect to somebody's story, all of a sudden we don't feel alone. All of a sudden, we feel seen when we hear somebody else's story. So I love that you have these stories that um, one has has moms and caretakers feel seen, but also for teachers, right? They have this whole other experience. And yes, I'm also a fan that they said that they have changed as a result because, you know, I think you can, uh, you've had, there's a variety, uh, a spectrum of experiences that you have with teachers and teachers that have real empathy and, and really, um, put in the emotional energy to support you versus just kind of checking the boxes. Yeah. And it is something that I am super proud of. And, um, you know, I, it is very difficult. Like I said, for teachers, we don't get that training at all. It's all very clinical. It's all, you know, and, and so um, to, to reach them and, and help and, you know, they're, they're going to change multiple students' lives because mm-hmm. of their new approach. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm very much um, excited about the opportunities that have been given that I really didn't anticipate when I started writing the book. Originally it was, you know, oh, it's going to be for anybody. And then I was like, no, I really want to hone in on the teachers. And it's, yeah. it's been, it's been really fantastic that way. So enough about me, this is about you. So <laughs> <laughs> We can, if you want to have me on yours, we'll talk about me on yours, but this is about <laughs> you. So, um, so tell us more about the, the coaching that you're doing. How does that work exactly? And, you know, um, I noticed on your website that there's a, a free self-care guide. Why is that so important? And I know you've mm. touched on it a little bit, but why don't moms, especially moms of children with disabilities, do that enough? Well, there's a couple of really good questions in there, so I'll try not to to skip over anything. <laughs> so um, first, I'll talk about the self-care question, and then I'll, start, I'll talk a little bit about um, the life coaching um, bit. So what I find, well, so self-care is, um, you know, it's someone, it's the word's real, uh, it's a buzzword out there uh-huh. right now. And so a lot of us hear self-care 
especially moms with special needs kids, and they automatically discard it as in it's not an option. Why? Because a lot of us attribute self-care to doing more, to um, to things that are perhaps comforting and perhaps even valuable, but aren't necessarily how I how I view self-care. Um, and so self-care, it's one of those things where I feel like I shout it from the rooftops and I still only get like 2% of people to actually hear the heart of self-care. Right. And so this is an emphasis in, in when I work with people because um, I, I think so many people actually also, we don't recognize the um, opportunity cost of when we don't care for ourselves. So most of us don't care for ourselves properly because we feel like it's either us or our child. And we're not willing to not choose the child. So by default, we basically slowly shrivel and, and suffer. Right. And so this is the, the lens that we're looking at. And so because we have this lens, we constantly don't see how. So we don't have time. We don't have energy. We feel like we don't have money. And I think also it's because this idea of what self-care is is so um, distorted. You know, a lot of us, you know, the joke is like it's a massage and a bath. And while those things can help, I think caring for your body is very helpful. Um, what I find is the self-care that most of the moms need is actually a more of a nurturing, more of a kindness to oneself. So most of the moms that that I come in contact with have a habit of, of self-criticism and judgment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if we just look at the, the load that that takes on somebody and we learn to relieve that a little bit, that produces an entirely different experience for that mom. And I was going to get to say, what, so it's like the reason we don't take care of ourselves is because we don't want to take away from our child. But when we don't take care of ourselves, we actually are, are unable to care for our child. So an example here is like if we haven't emotionally cared for ourselves um, and we're trying to hold it all in, you know, we might be sad, we might be angry, we might have all these things that we just are bottling and then we exploded our child. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, children are going to be children and and a lot of our children are are, are a little extra. So it's extra easy to be triggered by them. Mm -hmm. And we don't recognize, okay, like me not caring for myself is actually disabling me from being able to show up for my child in the best way that they deserve. So I think it's like recognizing it's not like, Oh, I should do this. It's more like, this is like, like air. Like this is like the most important thing to do. And it is counterintuitive, especially because our society, especially with moms is give, 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 do, do, do. That's your value. And so it's like, uh, unattaching ourselves from production, unattaching ourselves from um, saying yes to all the things that we are asked to do as moms. Right. It's tough. You actually have to be willing to be with the discomfort of not pleasing everybody. So there's a lot I could say on self-care, but I'll leave it there. So that's obviously, you know, really the the heart of self-care is is for me, self-love. And it's really looking at how to how to fill our own buckets in all the different categories. Like if you really love yourself, you're going to treat your body differently. You're going to treat your mind differently. You're going to have different conversations with God. Um, and I think all of that together, when we care for ourselves, we get to have a very different experience. So, okay. So coaching. Um, my fear when I first started uh, coaching for special needs moms was that they were going to think that I was some expert at being a mom to special needs child, as in I knew all the things about IEPs, I knew all the things about all the therapies, I knew all the things. And that's not the case. I know not all the things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am learning a lot, always. Um, and so it's like, because here's the thing is, oftentimes, we immediately turn to help the child. So most podcasts at the time that I enter the show, um, the scene, were geared towards helping the child. Okay, let's do this thing. And then that way, you're, you're, we're going to help your child, which is great. Nothing against that. But what I found is the moms are being left behind. Like There was nobody serving mothers. And so I uh, serve mothers. You know, so I come along a mother and support her. And so some of the conversations we have are about how to help the child, but most of the conversations are how to um, grieve, 
how to find childcare, not, not in the, the mechanics of it, but actually how to be willing to train somebody, how to have the confidence to train somebody, um, you know, having IEP conversations on how they want to show up as a leader. We talk a lot about leadership. We talk about, as I mentioned before, the re uh, invention of our identity. And so we talk a lot about those uh, types of things as kind of like the wholeness of the woman that we are. So where we start often is uh, there's a singular focus of caretaker. And so the idea or oftentimes what happens is we, we reinvigorate uh, all the different identities that actually give this, the mom, the wholeness of life that she wants um, and kind of, again, help her refine out who she is and, you know, ground her, right. Learn how to deal with the overwhelm, learn how to, to calm the chaos, um, learn how to be kind to herself instead of judgment and really learn how to, you know, how to manage a mind. So, um, so that's a little bit about kind of, what life coaches or in my, in my definition of what life coaches for special needs moms do. Uh, that's certainly not going to be everyone's way of defining it. It's um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that that people are now supporting this community, um, which is great. You know, I have, I have no issue with that, but this is where it's like, I don't have to be the expert in any one thing because I can empower a mom in terms of uh, really activating her own leadership so that then she can go out and find the resources that she needs to do whatever the thing is, whether it's, you know, finding more community resources, whether it's, again, advocating at IEPs and dealing with all the dif- discomfort that comes there. Um, so that's kind of, a, I get to the root and the heart of the issue and support moms. That's so awesome. So there's some things that you said in there that I would like to pull apart if you are okay with doing that. Yes. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that you mentioned is the um, child care. And, you know, like you said, not the mechanics of finding a babysitter, but sort of, but as well, just the like training someone. Um, and, and so, you know, in my experience, whenever I needed a a daycare provider, or, you know, my husband and I wanted to have a date night or whatever, we would, we would call up a family member or a a local teenage girl and say, Hey, are you available on this time? And yes or no. Okay. If not, then we, you know, we go to the second option. Um, Why is it so difficult for the moms that we're talking about today? Mm, There's so many reasons why it's hard. Um, There's so many reasons. There's the the tactical actual reasons where it's like finding, you know, some of our kids require very specialized care and finding somebody that's willing to take on the training that's going to be listening, you know, to, to actually provide the care for our, our child. That's sometimes difficult, especially when my child has a lot of behaviors. So finding somebody that's not professionally trained uh, is difficult. Um, and so that's one reason. So like actually finding the the exact skills and I, th- but then there's also this piece where I think a lot of moms have the, the, the belief in the background that nobody can do it as well as I can. Mm-hmm. And so they haven't taught themselves how to trust somebody else with their child. And I make it sound so simple when I say it like that. But remember, I, 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 I just acknowledge how hard it is. So it's like right. we can acknowledge how hard it is, but you, that doesn't mean that we stop. And so where I kind of push moms is to actually saying, okay, well, what do you need? Like what would be the conditions of satisfaction for a, a caretaker or a babysitter, whatever we're going to call this person, to, to care for your child in a way that you can leave them? And so we actually end up looking, okay, like what is the dream? What is, what is the thing? And we stay there in this what energy for a bit or the, the what thinking. Um, and then we move to the how. A lot of times what happens is we jump to the how and we say, how am I going to find this person? We're going to automatically say it's not possible. I just told you it's really hard. And so then we're going to stop asking ourselves. We're going to shut it down. So we stop there. And, and this happens not just in this, it, this happens everywhere. I do business coaching as well. It happens in all the businesses. People stop the brainstorm. They stop the, um, the future visioning because they immediately come up with an objection of that won't work. Mm-hmm. So we stop. So it's really important just to focus on, allow ourselves to focus on the what we want. 
the thing that we don't know if it's possible, but we want it and allow ourselves to be in that space where we're like, I don't know, like allow ourselves to be in that space of possibility. Mm -hmm. And then we can figure out the how. So I I, kind of straying from kind of why it's so hard. But I mean, I think it's it's hard for all the reasons that even, you know, getting an IEP team together that really understands and and meets your child where they are. It's it's difficult. Like in in this case, like actually my IEP for my son right now, I'm like, I'm not totally sure that they're understanding executive function in a way that actually serves him. And it's like, I barely understand it. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit like, um, I don't know. Um, and so, you know, but again, it looks like, okay, well, what's the what? The what is, I want my son to have a fully supportive team. That means I need to learn more about executive functioning. And then that means one thing after another. But anyhow, um, yeah, it, it's hard for a lot of reasons. Yeah, and I, I, I never realized how difficult it was until I was in um, my second or third year of teaching. And I had a student who was about the same age as my daughter um, and she had Down syndrome and there was a Down syndrome uh, buddy walk being sponsored in our area. And so I was like, Oh, this will be awesome. You know, I'll take, we'll take our daughter and, you know, I'll take, see if the parents will be okay with me taking their child and, you know, we'll go do this. And I asked them, and like I said, I had been teaching her for a couple of years at this point, and it, it it felt like I'd had a good relationship with them, and it took them some time to get back to me. And I was like, okay, first of all, that was weird because I'd never, you know, had that kind of experience ever asking to take my nieces or my daughter's friends places or whatever. And so they finally agreed, and um, the day comes for us to pick her up. And as the dad is putting her in the car seat in our car, because she was only eight at seven, seven or eight at the time. Um, or, but, and, and he says, you realize you're the first person that we've ever let take her somewhere away from us. And I stopped and I looked at him and I said, well, you mean outside of family? And he said, no, ever. And Talk, I mean, I mentioned the weight that that goes onto parents' shoulders, you know, when they get that original diagnosis. I felt so overwhelmed in that moment. The, the amount of trust in me, because not only was it me taking their daughter, but my husband was with me. Mm-hmm. Not only was my husband with me, but he was the driver, you know, and not only did were we taking her, but we were taking her like 30 minutes away. And this was before cell phones. So it wasn't like I could send pictures or text message updates or anything on a regular interval. We were going to have her, you know, six or seven hours. And I just, my entire demeanor changed from that moment forward. And I, I still don't totally grasp it. I don't think because I've not lived it, but the um, just the immenseness of that moment was beautiful and overwhelming all at the same time. Yeah, and as you share that story, you know, I'm just thinking about um, all that we as moms or, or dads uh, or caretakers have going on in the back of our mind constantly about managing our children. So at school, they get to see a small, hi Sumi, at school they get to see a small percentage of what's necessary, especially with my son's medical stuff. And they actually even get to see a small percentage of his, of his uh, emotional outbursts. And so people don't offer to watch our kids. So, you know, the neighbor says, oh, hey, send the kids down. Come on over, you know, come over. Or, you know, a friend says, hey, we're, just drop the kids off. It's fine. We don't get to drop our kids off because there's such a manual, a literally a manual to be able to care for our child and to be able to be there for that outburst or the seizure or for the medication management. And so I think it's like, it's maybe perhaps uh, less visible to see all that really goes into managing our kids. And so, as I mentioned, people don't offer and therefore we don't practice teaching people how to, we don't practice one asking for people to help. We don't practice actually uh, creating a manual so that we actually can have somebody watch our child. And, and this is one of those things where um, 
admittedly, I think uh, I even need to grow in this area. Um, but one of my friends here locally that I've gotten to know, her daughter's now 24, a college graduate, um, and fully dependent, 24-7 care is what she needs. She's uh, currently uh, using a wheelchair, and I think she has most of her life. And, um, but when her, when she was 10, when the, when the daughter was 10, her mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. So her mom is a primary caretaker who was doing all the things that we all do, um, Mm -hmm. was suddenly unable to care for her daughter. And so she obviously out of necessity had to train people, had to get the resources, had to do all the things to be able to actually be removed from the situation. Now, most of us don't want to be in that situation. And I know she didn't either. But for her, it taught her that she had to. And actually, I have an episode um, with her. Um, her name is Gay on my podcast. Um, and she's a really remarkable mom in, in terms of what she, um, what she has created out of, you know, being her daughter's mother. Um, and I love her attitude and kind of the way she shows up for her daughter. But anyhow, so it's one of those things where, again, this is one of the things, this is not really optional. Like, we think it is, but, like, we really do like have to figure out how to have somebody else care for a child. A lot of us um, won't out or some of us will outlive our children. Some of us won't. Um, But in the event that we do, I think it gives me so much peace that I will be able to have my son have the care he needs no matter what. And I think that that's what a lot of us want to have is we want to know that our, our son or daughter is going to be well loved and well cared for in any situation. Yeah. And as a teacher, um, I worked with most of my students for many years. And then also, you know, as I said, had family friends and family members that um, are mentioned in the book, but that I I also just knew that didn't aren't in the book. And and I just thought I had a good idea of what it was like. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so when I had the ideas for the story and who, you know, what, what people to ask, I thought, oh, you know, I, I'm only going to have to fill in a little bit because I, I got, I got it. I know it. I was so wrong, Mm -hmm. Kara. I, I I say now that, you know, once I started interviewing these different people for the book, I realized that I, I maybe have a thimble full. I was picturing an iceberg as you're describing this. (laughs) You kind of saw the tip and then what you've learned is like, Oh, there's actually this whole like under world (laughs) that these people are, these parents are managing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and Fran had mentioned it before that respite care is rare Mm -hmm. and to get that from family and friends, first of all is, is rare, but then to even go outside of family and friends outside of that circle and find agencies or state Mm -hmm. organizations that hire that is even more difficult And one of the things that almost every family that I know who has a child who has more severe needs, more significant differences, is exactly what you said and what Fran is saying here, that there, you know, some people don't outlive their child. And when they talk to me and I would say, like, what's your biggest fear? And I would ask my my students' parents this, like every year I have a questionnaire that I would give out to my parents it was incredible to me how many of them said, I worry about what's going to happen to my child when I'm not here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while, you know, Fran says her hope is to live one day longer than her child or her children, actually, um, that, you know, it's going to be sad for my daughter when my husband and I are gone, but that's not the kind of worry and fear that you have and so many, many millions of parents have for your child. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Hmm. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I think that, (sighs) I think moms make a lot of assumptions on, in this topic. Um, Well, actually, I think there's two things. I think one, (laughs) either avoid it completely. We just don't think about it because it's one of those things where it's like, we don't have an answer. It feels too big and hard. So we just look the other way. So I think that happens a lot. I think I might be a little bit guilty of that. Um, But when we do look at, I think a lot of us can't come up with a story that in any way feels safe or empowering. 
So again, we just look away again. Or, so I think there's two reactions. They, they look away, we look away, or we come up with something that's like really not cool. And we end up feeling a lot of stress and worry about that. Sure. And I think we forget the options that we have in stories that we create. And so I think one of the things that I have done is for me, the story I tell myself is that I will have a great way to care for my child. And I have a high degree of confidence that I'll be able to set up whatever he needs. And I have a couple ideas at this point that's like, okay, that would work. Um, nothing set in stone. Sure. But I think it's, I think the small difference is, is that I have learned to notice uh, a story and recognize it's just a story. It's not a fact. And learning to distinguish the difference between a fact and a story or interpretation Mm -hmm. uh, is really, really essential. So that's one of those essential skills that we, we don't come into life knowing right. it's not necessarily taught in school, but when we learn to distinguish the difference, it's a very, um, empowering thing, right? Cause I mentioned earlier, if we are trying to change a circumstance to feel good, then we're going to be swimming upstream. It's not possible. But when we get to distinguish, okay, a circumstance is a fact, we can't change it, but we can change the way we relate to that fact. That's where we kind of access our, our confidence, our power, kind of like not feeling trapped. We kind of feel like we can do something. So kind of back to the, you know, the idea that, you know, we, a lot of us don't know what our children, one will need in the future. Like, I think it's um, like for me, um, the way that I settle in my mind is I'm like, I see my child either being independent or not. But I have a way in my brain where whatever he decides to do or whatever he's able to do, it's fine. I don't need him to do one or the other for me to be okay. And I don't need, he doesn't need to do that to be okay. Like there's options. It's fine. Um, so I don't know. That's a little bit of my thoughts off, off the cuff on that one. <laughs> yeah. And I, and that's why I said, can you talk about it? Because I know that it's a, a tough subject to talk about and it's not one that, anybody ever wants to face, whether it's, you know, just drawing up a will for, uh, you know, like my husband and I, you know, that nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to think about death. So, you know, I can't imagine then transferring that thought to this could be, you know, what's going to happen after I can't do anything. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the very, very different thought process. Um, so, I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, you do have your self-care guide. Um, how do people, I've had your website up and that is Kara Riska, K-A-R-A-R-Y-S-K-A.com. Um, is that the main way that you have people contact you is through your website or is there, do you have social media pages? I Good mean, question. I have... Yeah. So I think the easiest way to chat back and forth and to say hi is through social media. You know, so I'm most active on Instagram on the Special Needs Mom podcast. That's my handle, the Special Needs Mom podcast. And uh, it's so fun. You, you want to get people popping up on there and, and getting conversations. And and I feel like one of the, the things that, that um, has been the biggest gift of the podcast is now this like vast network of moms and service providers and all the people um, as a result of, of the show. So that's probably the easiest one. If people aren't, um, I'm also on Facebook. Um, and actually, there's a, a Facebook group, a free Facebook group um, that's called uh, the Special Needs Mom Podcast Community, I think. <laughs> I was like, what is it called? Um, and yeah, there's direct links from it. I don't often say the name. There's direct links from that from my show. So in any of the shows, there's show notes that has direct links to the community. And it's just a couple clicks, you know, on Facebook to, to request to join the group. Um, and then yes, on my website, there's a contact me form. So if anyone wants um, really, you know, have any kind of conversation with me, I would welcome them to reach out there. Um, uh, it comes directly to me. So you'll get me, not some some other person out there in the world. Um, and I can attest uh, to that because that's how I reached out to her. <laughs> yeah. I may not be super responsive, as Shelly knows. Sometimes I do have <laughs> stuff that comes up. Um, actually, my business pod, excuse me, my business email, um, I only have, I don't have it come to my phone. Um, so I can kind of monitor when I'm working and when I'm not. So Shelly has the experience of maybe have not gotten prompt responses, but I would say um, eventually I do come around. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was your, your response time was, was just fine. Um, and can you work with 
parents, um, like we have Suri jo- Sumi, sorry, joining us from Bangladesh. Can you work with parents worldwide? Do you just do more local to you? How does that work? Yeah. So what's really great is along the way, you know, it's funny, I started out doing business coaching and that was what I did exclusively. And uh, so I was one to one, you know, I could work wherever. Um, However, it was one to one. Um, And so that's kind of what I was like, all right, I'll work with moms one to one. That's just, you know, why not? Um, I really hadn't thought of doing it any other way. And along the way, it became obvious to me that like my the moms, like they don't want to be alone. They don't want to act one, have the pressure of one-to-one coaching. They wanted to be in community. So as a result, what I created is a coaching community or um, a small group coaching program. And so this, this program is called Pathway to Peace. And the wonderful thing about it is people can access it from all over the world um, and really make it work for them. So there's a live coaching component where it's, we meet weekly for coaching for real coaching that has real application that's personalized and individualized. But then I have, um, kind of the masterclass of components of it where I take, um, the program, uh, participants through different modules, really kind of following the evolution of a special needs mom, building the skills, um, that are necessary, um, building the language that's really helpful in, in coaching conversations. So the lovely thing is it is it is completely accessible from wherever. And as long as somebody can work the time difference out between I'm in Pacific Standard Time. So in some cases, it may not work to, to show up at, you know, 10 a.m. Um, uh, Pacific Standard Time. So that would be the only limitation. But yeah, I have clients um, Canada, New York, all all the different places. Um, And it's really fun to kind of be uh, global, if you will. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's very exciting. And yeah, I kind of agree with you that, you know, um, the having that group community, it's, you don't, I think you just don't feel the pressure so much as if it's just you and one other person and you're left to like, tell me what your story is and tell me how I can help you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's like, um, there's also a huge value. And so the way group coaching works is that uh, one person is coached at a time, but it's in a, a group and getting to witness another mom, uh, be coached on a topic that a hundred percent you're going to relate to all well, me like 99%, but there's always some <laughs> application. Um, one, you get to have compassion for her. Um, you get to really kind of be with her and love her. And that has this, this gift of actually helping you feel the same way about yourself because you can see yourself in her. And for some reason, it's easier for us to extend the, the grace to other people than it is to ourselves. Right. So there's this actual like uh, magnified power of being inside of a community, especially because many of the moms already have a narrative of nobody gets me. Nobody understands. So when we're in this community, it's like, well, actually, all these people understand. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's been really powerful to actually have this kind of uh, structure for for the program that I have. That's awesome. Well, Kara, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, it is time for us to end. It's gone very quickly, I feel. And um, I would love to continue conversating with you, but I think it's it's time for us to go today. So um, thank you, Sumi and Fran, for joining us and for commenting. And um, make sure, those of you who are listening, that you reach out to Kara. I think she sounds like an amazing resource and one that is definitely needed in the communities um, of special needs parenting. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and I will see you next time. All right. Thank you so much.